So next we'll talk about what are the returns that physicians are getting to all of this medical training. Um, <clears throat> Unlike a lot of other occupations, uh, medical training benefits happen far into the future. So they're backloaded. It's on the back end of your career that you're going to be gaining the actual benefits of all of the training and investment that happens at the front end of the career. So the comparison that the textbook makes is to surfing, right? So if you look at this graph over time, um, at the beginning, um, when you're a f training to become a physician, it's a lot of negative in terms of financially as you're investing in your, med in your medical uh, tuition and you're also not making any money. After a while, eventually you'll enter into residency and your income will at least be a net positive. Uh, and then after that, you'll become a full physician and your income will kind of continue to increase. The dotted line in this graph shows the income trajectory of a person who becomes a surfer. You do have to train a little bit at the beginning, uh, but all of the benefits that you get from it, you kind of, you know, earn from the beginning, maybe a little bit more as you get better, and then they fall away towards the end as you become older, you can really no longer continue to be a surfer. So you have to be a really patient person in order to choose to become a physician. You have to value future returns, far future returns, uh, greater than your current losses. So the way that we kind of calculate the, um, you know, like what is the overall financial benefit when you combine both the fact that you're losing today and gaining tomorrow is, is through the net present value. So it's the net value of the costs and benefits that you're incurring over this time period. Um, and it's a way of calculating the value of future streams of income from today's perspective. So that's what this equation here shows you. The net present value, it's the sum, that's what this um, sigma um, represents. It's a summation from time zero, which is today, till time capital T, which is um, just the end, um, of delta to the T times your income from T. So delta is the discount factor. And that's why we're not just summing all of your income from today until the future. We're um, multiplying that income by this discount factor. And it's something that shows how much less you value the future relative to today. It lies between zero and one, so it's like a percentage. And it's really small if you are impatient and it's large if you're very patient. So if you have a high delta, that means you have a high net present value from being a physician because you are going to um, value the future a lot. Um, it's so if you think about the way it works mathematically, you have to multiply that value delta times the income. So if it's a large fraction, then you value all of that income very highly. And if it's a really small fraction, then that means that um, as the you know time increases, you're scaling the value of that future income to a much smaller and smaller level. So another way of expressing this discount factor is the following. It's delta equals one over, in parentheses, one plus r. So r is the discount rate. So we have to have this distinction between the discount factor and the discount rate. The discount factor is something that you are multiplying in this net present value calculation. You multiply future income by the discount factor. The discount rate is the degree to which you um, discount future years. So it's analogous to the market interest rate. You know that the... Um, Interest rates increase as uncertainty increases. And it's a reflection of, you know, the fact that if it's a loan, the fact that the person has to pay it back in the future and you can't 100% trust whether or not they're going to do it. So the interest rate increases because of the uncertainty of the future in the, in the marketplace. Um, when it comes to the individual valuing their futures, it's, it's kind of similar. You know, the future is uncertain and um, different things could happen you know, you just don't know. You just don't know. So that's why the um, R, the discount rate, is analogous to the market interest rate. And when R is, um, so the way that we measure R is to say that a person with the discount factor of delta um, would be indifferent between saving tomorrow and spending today, depending on what this 
interest rate R would be. So we can walk through a, um, an empirical example very quickly. So the example right here is just that if delta equals 0 0.9, then it corresponds with an R equals 0.11. So how did they get that? Um, we'll work it out. So if delta is 0.9 and it equals, let's say, it equals um, 1 divided by 1 plus r. And we don't know what r is, but that's what we're trying to figure out. By the way, this is the kind of thing that you'll have to do in the homework. So um, 0.9, now what we want to do, we want to isolate r. So we can just flip both of the fractions over. You know, any number is actually that number over 1. So if we, we can flip both of these fractions over. 1 divided by 0.9 equals 1 plus r. So what is 1 divided by 0.9? 1 divided by 0.9 is 1.1111. 1 1.1111 equals 1 plus r. So that means that r equals 0.1111. Um, so it's really just something that you can calculate, but in terms of understanding the relationship, then delta, when delta, when you have a high delta and a low R, that means you're patient. So they have an inverse relationship with one another, which you can see in the equation because um, it's one over R that is proportionate to delta. So they have an inverse relationship with one another. So a patient person, high discount factor, low discount rate. Okay, so we, if you want to understand kind of the net present value of, let's say a particular career choice, like being a physician, we can um, compare these two possible career choices. Let's say being a physician and being a surfer. They have income pads of you know, income of P and income of S. Now the internal rate of return that we'll represent with R star would be the discount rate that equalizes the net present value of both careers. So the net present value of one career versus the other is going to depend on how much you value the future as opposed to um, the present. So when you, in, what this equation represents here is like income of being a physician minus income of being a surfer, you know, divided by, one plus the interest rate, when you sum that over the time periods and that equals to zero, then, um, then that's what represents the number R star where they're exactly equal to each other. So if somebody's IRR um, is R star with P and S, then they value those two things equally, those two career choices equally. So in medicine, the IRR is really high. It's between 11% and 14%. So it's significantly higher than the market interest rate. So if you were to just take the money that you spend in tuition and invest it in the market, you would make a lot less money than you would on going doing, and doing that training. Um, this is true for dentists and lawyers as well. And for certain kinds of medical specialties, like being a neurosurgeon or an immunologist, for example, the IRR can exceed even that, even the typical medical um, IRR. So it's really high, and really any time that something is greater than the market rate, that's usually a signal that there's some market restraint happening. Um, being a physician is just highly lucrative you would think that that would attract more people to be a physician and which would eventually push the um, return on being a physician back down to the market level. But the thing is that there are a lot of barriers to entry into the physician um, uh, profession, you know, which might be able to explain the fact that the IRR tends to beat the market. So in the 19th century, being a doctor was actually really easy to do. Anyone could just call themselves a doctor. There, it wasn't really regulated and there wasn't official training involved. But the American Medical Association 
established prerequisites for going into medical school, required the four years of medical school that we have today, and required that physicians have a license to practice. There was a 1910 Flexner report that helped to shut down low quality medical schools, and the result is that there are less medical schools and there are less medical students and eventually fewer physicians, so it constricts constricts um, the supply of physicians in the market. So we have um, also caps on the size of medical schools and the way that physician licensure works, it makes it difficult for international uh, medical graduates. It's a really long and arduous process to being able to practice in the United States um, of you know trying to get into residency and passing boards and everything. Um, nurses and Physician assistants are very limited in the scope of practice that they're allowed to do even where and so and that actually varies between states in some uh, Physician assistants have wide latitude to write prescriptions and to see and diagnose patients um, And in others they can do very little so it clearly isn't a reflection of what that training um, Enables a person to do but it's about kind of the policy and the politics of regulation uh, even in alternative medicine practices, like in chiropractic and acupuncturing, um, licensure is required. So there are barriers to entry to just practicing medicine in general. A lot of it, it can be tied to the American Medical Association. And so there are trade-offs from having those barriers to entry because it constricts the supply of physicians and they're able to charge really high prices. So consumers have to pay more than maybe what it would be worth in a competitive market. That in that way, physicians are able to earn what are called monopoly rents. So monopoly rents in healthcare and in any other industry, it's when wages are higher than the competitive price that it should be getting paid due to the specifically like artificial constraint of the market. So in this case that physician supply is constrained. So barriers to entry, so there's that issue that it you know raises prices. But then on the other hand, these barriers to entry also ensure that physicians are qualified for their positions. So we face trade-offs in that regard. 